Hey everyone, Aisha here. So today I wanted to talk about the topic, draw near to the Lord, listen to him and obey because there is protection in obedience. And so today's lesson, I'm going to be teaching from Isaiah 48 verses 12 through 22. And so I'm just going to be like going through this and also teaching at the same time. And so verse 12 says, listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I am called. And so I wanted to pause there. I know that's super fast, but I wanted to pause there because there's one thing I really wanted to pull out to you. And so what God said in this, he said, listen to me. So first of all, that is a command, right? So God is starting off this section. And just so you know, this falls within the context of God telling Israel about him, about themselves. Like he had literally just checked them for being obedient, for being disobedient, rebellious, idolatrous, like so many things. And he's letting them know that even though they have been all these things, he's still going to rescue them from captivity. And the cool thing about this is this is like hundreds of years before they even go into captivity and before they get free. So when they go into captivity, they already have this message of hope, knowing that that bondage, that hard times, is not going to be forever, but it's ultimately going to be used to refine them um, in verse um, 48, in Isaiah 48, verse um, 10, he actually says he tried um, you in the furnace of affliction because he was trying to purify them, change their hearts so they can be who God has created them to be, but they were hard hearted. And so in this, he goes through and says, like, look, behold, I'm doing a new thing. And I'm telling you now I'm doing a new thing. And this is what's about to happen. So he's like, come, come. Draw near, come near to me, listen, listen to these instructions. And I feel like God is calling a lot of us, myself included, to draw near to him. Stop leaning on our own understanding. Come to him and get the instruction for the next phase, right? But in order to do that, we have to draw near to him. And so one of the other things that I love about this, he says, oh, Israel, uh, oh, Jacob, oh, Israel, whom I called, right? And so if we know anything about Jacob and Israel, Jacob was a liar, a deceiver, a trickster. And um, God took somebody like Jacob and turned him into Israel, right? Israel was new. So God was calling the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, the people who he chose, right? He was calling them by their old identity and their new, like, look, don't think that just because you might be walking old that I still haven't called you. I don't have a purpose and plan for you because he does. Because God had a purpose and plan for Jacob even when he was in his mess to make him Israel the father of a great nation, right? And so he's calling the old and the new because they're living old, right? But God still sees them as new and he called both. He called them, right? Even in their sin, just like what Jesus says, um, and I think it's in Romans, in Romans, yeah, while we were yet sinners, God saved us, right? So while Jacob was yet Jacob, he still saw them as Israel. So the people had no excuse to be able to um, disqualify themselves from the message of God because God called both Jacob and Israel, right? And so then he shows us who he is following coming along further in the second half of our 12. I am he, I am the first, I am the last, right? This is like reminiscent of I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, right? This is reference to the all creator, almighty, eternal God right and so he is the first and the last so he's establishing his authority why they should listen to him why because he is god the creator of the world he's going to be there in the beginning he's going to be there in the past and he was there in the beginning he's going to be there in the end right there is no there is no beginning and there is no end to god because god is sovereign god is eternal god is almighty right and then he goes on to talk about who he is his, he's laying out his like why you should listen to him number one he's the beginning and the end right Right? He's the first and the last. And then like, okay, now what? I'm, he's creator God too. And so he goes on to say, my hand laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. And so he's establishing his authority. He's showing us his resume. Like we can listen to him because he, we need to listen to him when he speaks because he's the same God who created the world. And not only is he the same God who created the world, he's the same God who created us. So we need to listen to him, right? 
And so then after that, in verse 14, he goes on to say, assemble all of you. And listen, again, you're hearing that gather, come to, come to God, come to me type language and listen. So he said, listen, in verse 12 and 14, at verse 12, he said, listen, this is who you are. Like, this is what I, or this is who I called you to be, and this is who I am, right? And in 14, he starts to talk more about the new things, but he's telling them, draw near, listen, right? And then he says, who among them has declared these things, right? So your idols are just that false. They're liars. They can't do anything about it. They can't do anything for you, right? So the idols are a liar. And so that continues on with some theme, with that theme of false idols that he'd been talking about over the last couple of chapters. And, and then earlier in 48, he had said, um, he had actually said in verse 5, he said, I declare them before, uh, from old before they come into the past. I announce them to you, lest you say my idol did them. My carved image and my a metal image commanded them. They're just like, those things are liars. They didn't tell you anything. But God is a God who knows the beginning from the end, which is why he said that he's the first and the last, right? And so he talks about like, so the idols didn't do it. These false gods didn't do it. Turn from these false gods. Turn from these idolatry. Turn from these idolatry. The idolatry is the thing that led them into captivity anyway. So turn from it. So he is really laying the foundations for how they should behave when they get free. So when they get free and they go back to Israel, they need not make the same mistake that they made in the beginning of turning to false idols and turning away from God. So God is letting them know, like, this stuff is a lie. This stuff sent you into captivity. This stuff sent you into spiritual bondage. But guess what? He is the fruit of life, right? Jesus is the living water. So when we turn to the one true God, the only true God who saves, that's where we have wisdom, right? And this is who we should listen to. And um, God is telling them again, like, look, the Lord loves him and he shall perform his purpose on Babylon and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. So he's reassuring them. He said this multiple times over the last few chapters, like he is going to rescue them by raising up Cyrus, the Persians, to overthrow the Babylonians to be able to free the people of Israel. And so he's letting them know that he is the one doing this, lest they believe that the king of Cyrus is the one who saved them. It wasn't the king of Cyrus. It was God. And it was God who raised the king of Cyrus up. And what he said in verse 15, I even I have spoken and called on him i have brought them that he must he will prosper in his way so he's saying i'm guaranteeing the people the king of cyrus victory to be able to save the people of israel so don't think and turn to cyrus as if there as if he's their liberator he's their rescuer because it's not cyrus it's god it's god's power working through cyrus to be able to accomplish his will and his purpose and i want to say one thing about this because sometimes we can really make the mistake of looking to people to save us. We can look to the government to save us. We can look to politicians to save us. We can look to coaches, mentors, teachers, whoever uh, to save us, right? But it is not people who save us. It's God who saves us. And so the sooner we understand that it's not people, it's not things, it's not, you know, that other stuff it is God. And God can work through people. He absolutely works through people. He worked through the king of Cyrus to save the people of Israel. But let's not get it twisted. It's not people. It's God right? And we have to think about this even in our own self because sometimes we can look at the self to save us. But it's not self, it's God. God may equip us, God may empower us, God may give us wisdom, but it's not us who saves. It's God working through us. And so I remember one time, this is actually when I walked away from God um, a number of years ago, a long time ago. I was in my early 20s and I walked away from God. And one of the reasons why I walked away from God is because I began to think that I was the one who allowed myself to go to prestigious schools. I was the one who got myself that fantastic career, that amazing paycheck. I was the one who got myself that accolades. And then to be honest, I was dealing with a lot of church hurt. And I was looking, I'm like, I fell into the trap of thinking that I only needed to be a good person. And I couldn't understand how I could see Christians behaving one way. But yet I saw a God of the Bible behaving something totally different. So I was kind of like, well, if this is what it means to be a Christian. I don't want any parts of it. I'm just going to be a good person. And But by the way, I was the one who got myself to where I'm at anyway. So who needs him? 
And so I fell into that track of ma trap of making myself to be an idol. I walked away from God, ended up coming back to him about seven years later because I realized I could not do this life without God. And so we have to be able to realize that even when God said that he will perform his purpose, um, that he said, I brought him, he will prosper in his way. Cyrus wasn't prospering on his own. He was prospering through the power of God. He won those victories through the power of God. And the same is true with us. When we are, when we win victories, right? When we overcome spiritual warfare, when we get promoted on the job, when we have an amazing um, elevation or hit a, an amazing milestone in entrepreneurship, it's not us. It's God working through us, prospering us in our ways. And then again, in verse 16, he says, draw near to me, come near. He's calling for a relationship because at this point, the people will, when God is talking to the people of Israel, they're outside of the promised land. So they feel they're physically isolated from their temple. They're physically isolated from their place of worship where they came to worship the Almighty God. So they're, feel, they're like spiritual exiles right now. And they feel like they're on the outside of God. They're wondering if God still cares. They wonder if they're still if God is still their father. They're wondering if they're still loved by him, accepted by him, um, close to him, right? And that's why you see over and over and over again, if you read the book of Isaiah, he says, Oh, Jacob, oh, Israel. Israel, whom I'm called because you might be in a hard time right now. He might feel like God has abandoned you right now, but God is still with you. He still called you. He still puts you as it is a part of his family. He will never leave you nor, nor forsake you, even when you're being disciplined. Even when it feels like things aren't going your way, he is still there and he is still God and he is still on the throne. So draw near and hear. Draw near and hear this. Again, the repetition of draw near, come close in relationship and listen. Because sometimes we miss out on the, on the blessings of God and the directions of God because we're not listening to him. We don't hear him. And so we're all doing our own thing because we haven't taken the time to draw near in relationship and to actually listen. Because sometimes we can draw near in prayer, but we talk too much and we miss God because we're too busy talking and we're not listening. God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, but sometimes we act as if we have two mouths and one ear. It's backwards. And so what he says is draw near to me and listen to it. Hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. And I love this. Like literally when I was reading this, I was like, is this Jesus? Is this Jesus talking? Like what? 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 I knew in Jesus, like in Isaiah earlier, like um, Isaiah is talking about the coming of Jesus. But I was just like, yo, this is Jesus talking. The Jesus that John says was the word of God. And everything was created through the word of God. This is Jesus speaking. And Jesus is saying, from the beginning, I, who, the word of God, right? Have not spoken in secret. Meaning Jesus has been here the whole time. The whole time. This ain't nothing new. Jesus is just coming as a physical manifestation of what he has always been. I was just like, yo. This is Jesus. And he said, from the time it came to be, I have been there. Jesus, the word of God has been there. You see in Genesis 1, God is speaking through Jesus to create the world. And he says, and now, right, this new thing, right, this is going from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Lord God has sent me in his spirit. I was just like, yo, this is Jesus saying that he is going to come on the scene. He's going to be operating through the spirit of the living God. And when he ascends back to heaven, his spirit will come into us, those who believe. And this is the thing that gives us the power to walk in obedience to God and to walk in righteousness. It's the spirit of the living God. It's through Jesus. Right? Okay, I'm getting so excited because like when I was studying this, I was just like, yo, this is amazing. And so in verse 17, it says, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. So I love this, right? God is reminding the people of Israel by his resume. Because we see in verse 12, he said, I am he, right? He. The Almighty God, the first and the last, right? 
He talks about himself as creator in verse 13. And when we jump down to verse 17, he's reminding them more about his attributes and his character. He said, thus says the Lord. So he is the Lord, right? But then he is redeemer. He is redeemer. Can you imagine? That would be like honey from a honeycomb to people who are in captivity. He is the redeemer. He is the one coming to set the captives free. He is the one that has the key to their jail cell that's going to allow them to walk free. He was the one who liberated us from sin. He was the one who liberated us from bondage. He was the one who liberates us from hard times. He's the one who liberates us when we feel like there is no other pathway, when we feel like we're boxing a corner and there's no way out. He is the one who comes to liberate us as our redeemer. And then he says, the Holy One of Israel. This is like, so. this is so personal, but yet so like huge. He is the Holy One. He is the one without sin. But then he says, of Israel. So he is their Holy One. He is their God. He is their Father. And they can trust in him. They can rely on him because he is a God of his word. He is without sin. He cannot lie. So he's letting them know that he is a personal God, but yet he is a powerful God. And they can count on him and they can count on his word because he cannot lie. And then he goes on in verse 17 and says, I am the Lord your God. So if you missed it, right? So if they didn't they, so if they missed already that God said he is the first and the last, if they missed the fact that he is the creator of the world, then he and if they missed the fact that he is the Lord, their redeemer, the holy one of Israel, he goes on to say, just so you don't miss it, I am the Lord your God, personal God. He's not the God of, you know, because they keep saying the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is true. But he's also their God. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were powerful people. But guess, not, guess what? The God who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob is the God of them right now. He is the God of Israel. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of us today. And this is just came to my spirit. Like when I read Psalm 121. I love Psalm 121, and I'm just going to flip to it right now real quick, because there's one thing that he says, um, that the Bible says, he says um, in verse 4, it says, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. What I do is I said, Behold, he who keeps Israel is the same God yesterday and today and forever. And because he is the same God yesterday, today, and forever, the same God who keeps Israel will need, is the same God who keeps Aisha and my family. And he will neither slumber nor sleep. And see, that's the beauty of catching the revelation of who God is. And then he says, and I love this, right? He says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way that you should go. So, okay, I want to give my notes right now because I don't want to miss this, right? Okay. I don't want to miss um, any of this, which the Lord was giving me today. So, um, okay. So he said, okay, so what we need to do in this is so I've talked about the relationship, right? And drawing near to God and listening. And so this is the only way that we're going to be able to catch God's promises. Because what he does is he gives us some promises. He says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you how to profit. So one of the things that, um, so, okay. So when I looked this up, I said, what is the word profit? Because I always think, you know, I have a finance background. I have a corporate finance background, personal finance background, certificate in personal financial planning, got an M MBA in finance, got an undergraduate degree in economics. So when I saw profit, I thought money, right? And profit is one word, uh, one version, like one of the definitions of profit, profit is money. So it is a financial term. And so what it also means is to um the concordance says to gain to profit to benefit and to avail and one of the other things that it says is to ascend to be valuable to um i don't i can't read my writing like i don't know what this says um to but it says to do good and to be profitable to gain profit right 
And it also means, and the new, new NIV version translates it into teaches what's best for you, right? And so this is so good because this is through, and so this is getting to wisdom, right? And so the only way to gain wisdom is the fear of God because Proverbs 1, 7 is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so one of the other things is that um, the only way in which we could, should go and the only way we will know which way to go um, and what the Lord is saying and how to live and how to do anything is through a relationship with God. It's through the word of God. And Proverbs speaks about this a lot. And so we're going to jump into uh, Proverbs for a little bit because I want there's some verses that I want to highlight to you. So let's turn to Proverbs 1 verse 33 so it says whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without fear of disaster so there's some benefits from drawing near to the lord and so you dwell secure and will be at ease without fear of disaster so there's some security right in this proverbs 2 verses 1 through 7 it says my son if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding yes if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures and then you will understand the fear of the lord remember according to verse 133 it's the fear of the lord it's the beginning of all wisdom and find the knowledge of God. So, right, if you seek wisdom, you'll find it. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, right? So this is so good because it lets you know that we can ask for wisdom and we should ask for wisdom earnestly like this is just something like you pray one time for wisdom we should be seeking wisdom over and over and over and over and over again a repetitive thing because it says making your um ear attentive to wisdom first of all you have to be ready to hear wisdom sometimes your your heart and your mind and your ears are closed and you can't hear it so you have to pray for wisdom have to be able to pray to be able to understand to be able to hear it when it comes but you have to incline your heart that's a heart position raise your voice for understanding so we should be crying out asking god for understanding seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasures like i don't know if you've ever seen those shows where people are like hunting for gold right like they don't hunt for gold one time they keep going to the same location over and over and over turn over every rock run it through the water get like look for through different methodologies right and try and uh, like gain different little devices and everything to be able to search for gold like they don't look one time and give up we have to keep going to the lord to be able to get wisdom because that's the only way that we're going to be able to move forward we should search for it earnestly um proverbs 2b says that when we have wisdom right he um wisdom is a shield right it's a shield is a protective term think about you know people in the in the army like a long time ago they had a shield and a sword and the shield was used to to be able to block blows from the enemy and then when we look in terms of the full armor of god which paul talks about in ephesians the shield is designed to extinguish the fiery arrows of the evil one so wisdom is a shield and if you think about it it makes so much sense because when you have wisdom you don't do stupid stuff that can get you hurt or killed it helps you to avoid toxic people dangerous situations that would do things that would cause death and injury so wisdom truly is a shield Proverbs 2 verses 11 and 12 says it is. Um, and so when you have wisdom, it says discretion will watch over you, right? Deli understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil and from men of perverted speech. Because people can get other people in trouble. You hook up with the wrong person, it could be catastrophic. And so wisdom helps you by giving you the discernment and the wisdom to make better choices and then make better decisions, starting with and, and well, including in the people who you decide to marry, be friends with, hang out with, or interact with. And so, and so, um, it also says that 
one, okay, in Proverbs 3, verses 16 through 18, it says, Long life is in her right hand, and her left hand are riches and honors. Honor. Her ways are pleasantness, and her paths are, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. So there are some benefits to wisdom, right? Um, long life. Again, you're not doing stupid stuff that will cut short your life. Riches and honor. Pleasantness, right? Peace. A tree of life. And not only a, a, a tree of life for you, but for other people who are connected to you. To those, right? And so, and blessed. So there's a blessings in wisdom. Let's jump down to verse 23 in uh, Proverbs 3. Then you will walk on your way securely and your foot will not stumble. Right? You will have a smoother pathway in life because you won't do things to make things harder for yourself. Um, it'll help you to avoid situations that could be destructive or make life harder. So you'll walk on your way securely. Your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. You have peaceful sleep, right? When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid. So you won't have fear, right? Or, um, because you know that the Lord is your confidence and he will keep your foot from getting caught. So there's just so many different things, benefits for wisdom. And again, with the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And we see in Isaiah, jumping back to Isaiah 48, um, verse 16, we see that Jesus is coming and he's giving us his Holy Spirit. And that's the only way that we can do these things to make better choices and to be able to have a better outcome in our lives and to allow us to walk in the ways of the Lord. And then we see also that um, because and then also one of the things I wanted to put out to this, um, I'll point out is that in verse 17, it says, who leads you in the way in which you should go? So we are following behind Jesus. Jesus is the one, Jesus through his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is leading us. So our job isn't to walk in a space of self-sufficiency, but it is to follow the Lord. We follow Jesus. Jesus is our leader. And the only way in which we can have this wisdom, the only way that we can walk in the promises of the Lord is to follow Jesus. And that is only possible through his Holy Spirit. And so then when you get move on into verse 18, right? This is where it gets so real. This is where it gets so real. Isaiah 48 verse um, 18. Man, right? Man, this just lets you know, like, honestly, like, as I am thinking about this, like, my like my heart is heavy. Like, my, like, I'm tearing up, right? Because God goes on to say the missed blessings and the missed promises of the people of Israel, because they did not listen to him. They did not follow him. In 48, I was just like, when I was studying this, my, like I said, my mind was like, yo. Because in verse 48, in um, Isaiah 48, in verse 4, he, this is why they could not walk in the blessings of the Lord. They had hard hearts. But the, they said it three different ways. He said, because I know that you are obstinate. Then he goes on to say, your neck is as I is an iron sinew. Iron, right? Stiff neck, right? You hear it over and over and over again in the Bible. Stiff neck, right? And when I looked it up, I was like, why do I keep talking about stiff neck? Like, what is this? And it's an agricultural term. So when oxen were yoked and they were supposed to plow the field in the um, actual yoke, there were these little spurs in there. And so when the, um, when when the when the person when the farmer wanted the oxen to turn they would he would turn the yoke and then it would kind of prick them in the neck and then the oxen were supposed to move in the direction that the farmer was directing them to but what would happen is sometimes the oxen were obstinate sometimes they didn't want to listen sometimes they would buck and fight and not want to go the way in which the farmer was going but there were built-in punishments and built-in consequences so the spurs instead of just pricking them and being a little uncomfortable to get them to move in the way that the um that the farmer was trying to get them to go it would hurt them right it could draw blood because now it was jamming them in the neck 
because they weren't going in the way in which the farmer will lead them to go. That's why it says stiff neck because it's resisting correction. It's resisting direction. It's resisting guidance. And so rather than move in the way in which the farmer, they chose the hard way, the way of pain. And we can do the same thing. And this is like why God is telling them like over and over and over again, like you are obstinate. You, your neck is as hard as sinew. You're being hurt by your decisions, but you don't see it. You're so blinded that you don't see it. And then he goes on to say, and your forehead brass, hard headed, right? Our hand is soft behind, right? And so this is why they weren't going. And this is so heartbreaking because so many of us follow in the same footsteps. So many of us do the exact same thing and we miss our blessings. We miss out on our abundance. We can miss our purpose and destiny in life through disobedience, through abstinence. And this is what happens. God was laying it out. This is what they missed. Like, this is what they missed. He said, oh, that you have paid attention to my commandments. Then, this is what happened. This, this is what would have been their portion, but was not their portion. Then your peace would have been like a river. And your righteousness, like the waves of the sea. Your offspring, so they would have had righteousness. They would have been able to live upright and right living. They would have had blessings that flow from righteousness. And so if you look, I might have to do a study on this one day. I'm going to, um, but um, if you look at Deuteronomy 28, there's built in blessings and curses, right? And so there's blessings that flow from righteousness. So had they, the, their righteousness like waves of, sea, of the sea, they would have had all these blessings that would have came to them instead of this destruction. It's that your offspring would have been like the sand. They would have had tons of kids, right? Their offspring, their family, their legacy, what they would have been able to do for the longer term, it would have been there, right? And so you see that they would have had good character. They would have had the built-in promises that flows from righteous living. They would have lots of children. And we see in the in the word of God that children were valuable. Like not, I mean, it was not just like valuable, but um, the Bible says that the children are a heritage from the Lord. Um, Exodus 23, 26 says that barrenness and miscarriage is a curse. And so to have children meant that you would have had um, a lot of people to be able to build wealth because there would have been a whole bunch of people working in the farms, in the field. Um, there would have been people to be able to care for the parents when they were sick and old. Uh, there would have been people to be able to pass inheritance down. So that way inheritance and property and money would have stayed within the family. So there were so many benefits to having tons of children. And if you look at the whole baby war between Rebecca and Leah, it was about who can give the most children to, um, it was to Jacob. And children were seen as a blessing instead of like now where it's this whole twisted like demonic agenda um, that talks about how children are a burden and everything like that. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And like this is why they're like this demonic agenda about abortion. But, but children are blessings. The Bible is very clear that children are blessings. They're not curses, they're not inconveniences, but they are a way that God shows his hand of favor on his people. And so again, he goes on to talk about the benefits of having a lot of kids, right, as one of his blessings. He said, and your descendants, like, it's grains. And this is really some echo back to what was promised to Abraham. When God promised Abraham that his children would number the stars in the sky and the, gra the grain of the sand, he would have so many descendants that his name would be like made great, right? And so God is promising that, that their name would be great. They would have an amazing legacy. He said, then their name would never be cut off or destroyed from before me. So they would have a legacy. Um, they wouldn't be brought into destruction because what ultimately happened because they did not fear God. They did not listen to God. They did not walk in a way of uprighteousness. They did not honor God. Ultimately, they had no peace. They went into captivity. They experienced 
a lot of death and destruction. They were taken from their land, made into slaves. They were cut off and their legacy was cut short. All because of lack of obedience. But listen to the grace that is still in this. He goes on to say in verse 20, go out from Babylon, free from Chaldea. And this, I want to stop right here because even in this, there's grace. Even in this, there's mercy because these people are in captivity at this point. But God has already promised to make a way for them to leave captivity. And what he's saying is that get, I'll go out from Babylon and flee. So when they're free to flee, right? Oh, I like that. When they're free, they should flee, right? Because, and this is one thing that I want to say. Paul talks about this in Romans. That when we're free in Jesus Christ, we're we're no longer slaves to sin, but we are righteousness. So we should flee from sin and we should no longer do the things that are displeasing from God. We should no longer do the things that are hurtful and harmful to other people, to us and who God has created us to be because now we're now free. We're no longer in bondage to sin. But, here's a but, so most of the people who went into captivity in Babylon, they didn't leave. Only a remnant left. Only a handful of people left. Some people chose to stay in the land of captivity. And they didn't leave. And they were cut off. They were cut off. And when we see it, God said, go out from Babylon. God didn't say stay. God didn't say stay. He said, go. Flee. Go back to your native land and build the heritage of the Lord there. That's what he did. But when God rescues us, this just came and just dropped into my spirit. But when God rescues us, when God liberates us from our fear, when God liberates us from our sin, when God liberates us from toxic people, when God liberates us from toxic jobs or things that don't serve us, how many of us run back to the very thing that God delivered us from? We all do it. We all do it. But when God sets us free, we are to flee. We are to walk new, live new, ask new creatures in Christ. And then what he also tells them to do is declare this with a shout of joy and proclaim it. So they are to praise, worship, give God praise, give him his adoration because he has rescued them. He and they are to engage in praise and worship. Send it out to the ends of the earth. So they're not only to praise and worship in their own personal environment. They are to share their testimony with other people. Um, in Revelations, I think it's either 14 or 16, it says we overcome through the blood of the lamb and through the words of our testimony. We overcome through accepting Jesus Christ and by sharing our testimony with other people because that is the thing that allows other people to be set free from their bondage and their captivity, right? Because when I share my story of how I overcame the pressure to abort my twins and yet God still provided it for me, even though I had no idea what was going to happen by becoming a single mom as a full-time entrepreneur who just quit their job. My testimony now gives somebody else the hope who is standing on the fence wondering what they're going to do, whether they're going to terminate or whether they continue. My testimony through me sharing shows other people that there's, other, that there's hope. They can navigate the impossible plug. That's the name of the book, right? <laughs> they can navigate through the impossible because if God did it for me, he can do it for them. He is no respecter of persons, right? When we begin to share our testimony, we give hope and we give glory to the one who set us free. So we are to send it out to the end of the earth. Jesus in his, um, in the Great Commission, he said, go out and proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's what we're called to do. But too often we're sitting silent. But we need to be vocal, loud with our praise, with the sharing of our testimony. Because that is how we point others to Christ and that is how they get saved. And then it says, say the Lord has redeemed his favorite Jacob. The Lord has set us free. The Lord has redeemed us. And then in verse 21, I love this. He said, they did not thirst when he led them through deserts. He made water flow from, for them from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. And so 
he oh my gosh this is so good i want to make sure i don't forget anything so what this is is a reference to exodus and the number of times where jesus made water appear in the middle of the desert so in the middle of barrenness which you know you can only live without water for so long and then people die right but jesus but but God provided um, water through unexpected sources. So in a barren land, in the wilderness, God provided water. Who, what is our water now? We have physical water, yes. But Jesus is our living water. And so the other thing is, and this is also encouragement for the people who are going to be leaving Babylon. Because they have to walk through a desert. They're going to have to navigate through desert land, hot no water um you know they have to deal with bandits and everything people looking to rob them of their wealth hurt them in the desert it was a very dangerous journey it wasn't just like marching through like you know a normal street it's dangerous um it was treacherous um it was dry it was hot they had real physical needs that they were going to need in order to make that trek from Babylon to Israel. So the people needed to be encouraged. And so what God was saying is that because they're going to need to walk through things in the desert again to get from Babylon to Israel, they're going to need to remember what God did in the past for when the people of Israel left Egypt to go to Israel. That they don't need to fear, like don't make the same mistake where the people of Israel took a couple of week journey and turned it into 40 years because they're grumbling and complaining. Remember that God will sustain you. Remember that even though it looks barren, even though it looks arid, even though it looks desolate, if God turned water, made water come from a rock, he's going to sustain them in their journey. So don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. Don't grumble and complain. Don't question God because he is in it. And so what he was doing, he was making provision for their faith. Because remember how I said this was written hundreds of years before the people of Israel even went into captivity. So what he did is before they went into captivity, he made sure that he knew that they had that they knew that they had a promise of freedom. And, a pro and because they have a promise of freedom, they can maintain their faith during the 70 years of captivity, but also to have the faith to be able to flee from their captors when the time was come for them to be set free, that they didn't just stay where they are. And even um, faith during the journey, so even if it looks bleak, even if it looks hopeless, remember how God took care of the people of Israel when they were leaving from Egypt. And going into the promised land. So if he cared for them then. If he provided for them then. He will provide for them now. And that's not just a message to them. It's a message for us as well. It's a message of hope. Like if you're a single mom. Like there's a message of hope. God's got us. God's got your kids. God's got my kids. Right? Um, if you're an entrepreneur. God's got your business. In your career. God's got your career. God's got everything. In the palm of his hands. So we don't have to stress, grumble, complain. We can walk in the purpose and plan that God has for us. Because he is the one who knows the end from the beginning. He is the one who saves. And also even in the rebuilding. Because remember, it's been 70 years. But since the people of Israel had been taken from the land. So other people had moved in. Like they were allowed um, by the king of Persia to be able to allow them to go back. But there were going to be people there. And they had to have the faith to be able to rebuild the walls of their city, to be able to rebuild the temple in the face of opposition from the people who had moved into that space who did not want to give them the land. And even when it was hard, even when they questioned whether they had enough resources, they, God is with them in it. If God can bring forth water from the rock, God can keep them in all things. And again, we overcome through the blood of the Lamb and through the word of his testimony. And one of the other things is, is Hebrews 11, 6 says, God rewards those who diligently seek him. And so we see over and over and over again, like this is a message of diligently seeking God. We seek God by drawing near to his presence and we seek God through listening to him, through prayer, through the word of God. That's what we do. And then I love how he ends this, right? 22 he says there is no peace as the lord for the wicked and this just lets you know like this is like god this is like look draw near to me listen to me 
Obey my commands and don't worry about them other people. Don't worry about those people who are trying to impress, uh, oppress you. Don't worry about those people who betrayed you. Don't worry about those people who turn their back on you. Don't worry about the people who are hating you. Don't worry about the people who are trying to block you. Don't worry about those people who are trying to hurt you. Because when he says there's no peace for the wicked. And when he's saying in this, he's just like, you know what? Listen to me. Draw near to me. Obey me. And don't pay attention to those distractions. Don't let other people get you off the path that God has you on because there are built-in consequences for people who want to do wickedness. He said there's no peace. He's got it. And God said, like Jesus, where is it in there? It says, vengeance is not yours, it's the Lord's. So it's not our job to try and get people back. It's not our job to try and do all this extra stuff, Right? It's not our job to be burdened by the past. It's not our job. It's not for us to be hurt. It's just walking in constant hurt, pain, fear. It's not, we're not supposed to retaliate because God is going to take care of it. God, um, I mean, <laughs> business is the Lord. And then, uh, it's the Lord's in Proverbs 30, uh, Proverbs three, Proverbs three, verse 33a says, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked. And so all we need to do is just keep walking in the ways of the Lord. And this really blessed me because sometimes, you know, I can get caught up still by ways in which people hurt me, ways in which people betray me, ways in which people did me wrong. But it's not my job to think about that. Like, it, like all that does is burden me and prevent me from walking in the ways of the Lord and walk, for me walking in who God has called me to be. I have to trust that God, oh, my earring broke. Um... Okay, I have to trust that God has got me. And I also have to trust that God's hand is on that situation, right? So it's not my job to focus on the things of the past. It's not my job to focus on the things that have no bearing on my day-to-day -day life. But what it is to do is to walk in the ways of the Lord, follow him, draw near to him, obey him, and allow him to direct my path and then that way you know i can be in right standing with the lord and so i pray that this blesses you um and if you're going through a difficult situation know that god is there god sees you he hears you he loves you he cares so don't lose hope know that the same god who was with israel is the same god who is with you today and so i encourage you to check out my book navigating the impossible or survival guide for single moms from pregnancy through the first year of motherhood it is available on amazon as well as at navigating the impossible book.com if you want a signed copy go to navigating the impossible book.com and it really is a manual um, of hope and also instruction for single moms who are pregnant and early on in that pregnancy in their motherhood journey and it just really just helps you financially emotionally spiritually um and just helps you to just set yourself up and self set your life up in a way that honors god but gives you instruction on how to navigate what some might consider impossible because nothing is impossible with the Lord. And so make sure you grab a copy of your book. Make sure you like, subscribe, share this video with somebody who you know will be blessed and who will benefit from it. And so, yeah, that is it today. Thank you so much for joining. Talk to you soon.